Good morning, church. Good morning, church. All right, y'all, we are going to do, I said good morning, you said good morning, right? But on Easter Sunday specifically, there is a greeting that is traditionally said among us. And it goes like this. I say, he is risen, and you respond with, he is risen indeed. So let's try that. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Now, y'all, rise in kind. We're going to sing a song together to begin our worship today. And it's the only song that we get to sing today, because there's only one today in the liturgical calendar. It is Christ the Lord is Risen today. So please sing it with me. Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. All right. Thank you. Amen. Um, welcome to 1010. I'm Reverend Jessica Vaquetta, and we are so glad that you are here. I know I think we might have already run out of uh, some cups earlier today, but we've got plenty of coffee, so make sure that you, you grab some coffee throughout the service or a snack and just sit back, relax, and enjoy being in God's presence and the presence of one another. A quick question. Did you grab one of our Connect cards? Somebody has those. They're very colorful. Can someone hold them up? I don't have them. Yes, right there. Yes, yes. They, yes, there we go. Those are our Connect cards. And if you didn't get one, we have some at the back. 
We have some announcements about things that are coming up, and there's also some QR codes on there for you to scan and register your attendance or make a gift. And there's also a spot at the bottom of those cards where you can tear it off and write down any prayer requests that you might have. Please let us know how we can be praying with you and for you throughout the week. The ministers gather every Tuesday morning and lift up those prayer concerns. And you can leave those either right here in our offering plates along with any other gifts that you might have for the church when we share in communion together. Or we also have some prayer stations in the back here where you can leave your prayer concerns as well. And we have some attendance pads. Somebody want to hold one of those up for me? Thank you. I, need, I don't have anything. I need help. Yes, this is an interactive welcome. Um, we have these attendance pads scattered around the room. So you can write your name on there, pass it around to those around you, let us know that you're here, or you might have already done this. I've been talking so long. You can scan this QR code in the back and easily register your attendance online. And you can also fill out a prayer online as well. Let's see, and this is the fun part. If you haven't, if you don't have your phone on you, have a friend text you this picture. But get your phones out and take a picture of this slide because if you show your photo to the folks at Ampersand Coffee, either the university location or the location off of 7th Street, you will get 20% off your order at both locations. I took advantage of it last Wednesday and it was very nice. In fact, if you would, would want to get coffee with one of us and share the 20% off, let us know. We'd love to go get coffee with you on Wednesdays. Friends, we have journeyed through Lent together. We have journeyed through the dark and the barren and the difficult places. We have mourned Jesus' death. And today, we celebrate the resurrection. It is a day of new beginnings. Thanks be to God. Begin in the brightly painted kitchens, at the table set for supper and on the wide couches where we watch TV. Begin while we are sorting the laundry, writing out the shopping list and in front of our bathroom mirrors. Begin in the barns among the warmth of animals and the smells of grain and manure. Begin in the growing fields and in the flooded pastures and where the rains have not come and the soil is cracked and hard. Begin in the gleaming office towers, the shiny shopping malls, the sweaty factory floors. Begin on crumbling sidewalks and amid the rumble of subways, at machines, at our desks, by the coffee makers and computers. Begin with the rich, the comfortable. Begin with the poor, the desperate. Among the successful, the self-assured. Among the failed and the floundering. In the glitter of the halls of power and in the cold and shadowed corners of tragedy and defeat. Begin on a day when the sun is brilliant, on a day when the sky is gray, in a time when economies are favorable, in a time when all is rust, at the moment when leaders are caring, or amid indifference, hostility, despair. Let us begin beginning again, and whether we have begun and triumphed or begun and struggled and faltered, we will continue our beginning as we have from our beginning at Jerusalem, which is wherever and whoever we are.
notice at the bottom of your connect cards, there are prayer uh, concern cards. They tear off. They're perforated. Our clergy gather each week and pray for those. You'll have an opportunity later in the service to place those in the offering plate, or you can place them in the, uh, the bowl at the back uh, at the prayer station at any time during this service. We're going to take a moment and uh, center our hearts and our minds with a little silence, and then I'll lead us in a prayer. We'll end with the Lord's Prayer and singing the Amen. Let us be in a spirit of prayer. Holy One, with gratitude and thanksgiving in our hearts, we gather in this sacred space today to celebrate the joy of new life, of resurrection. We thank you that the empty tomb means new life for us all. God, we see miracles every day in nature and in our very lives. Help us to cling to the hope that you have in our lives, that you bring to our lives, that you are for our lives. As we see the beauty of spring all around us, may our souls and our spiritual lives bloom and grow with the hope of what is to come. Guide us through this time of worship. Be with our preacher. Let the words that he brings forth enter into our hearts and be reflected in the way we live. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son, the risen Christ, praying the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning and happy Easter. For thousands of years on this day, Easter Sunday, somebody has stood in front of a gathered congregation like this and said three simple words, Christ is risen, and the response from the people has always been, he has risen indeed. So let's try this together. Christ has risen. risen Amen. It is so good to see you. My name is Russ. I am the lead pastor here at University Christian Church. And I just want to say that whether you have been a part of this congregation your entire life, or maybe this is your first time to church or the first time in a long time, uh, we're just glad that you're here and so honored that you have chosen to spend your Easter with us. So uh, we have uh, in Scripture basically four accounts of the life of Jesus, the ministry and life of Jesus. Jesus. Uh, We call them gospels, which is a word that simply means uh, good news. And for the last several weeks leading up to, uh, during the season, uh, leading up to Easter, we have been reading together as a congregation the gospel of Luke. And we've been calling it the gospel of nobodies because what we've seen is that on just about every page that Luke paints this portrait of Jesus as being ultra concerned with those that, that, that society considers to be the nobodies, right? The marginalized, the invisible, those that have been made to feel like they are second class, the little, the lost, and the least. And so we have been looking at that. Today we're going to look at Luke's story again of the resurrection. Now, in just about all of the Gospels, uh, the accounts of Jesus' ministry up until the first, until this last week have moved along, moved along at a fairly good clip. But then when we get to this last week, starting what we now refer to as Holy Week, when Jesus gets to Jerusalem, everything just sort of slows down and we get a whole lot more detail, a whole lot more nuance. 
And what we see in this last week is all sorts of pain and betrayal. There is uh, humiliation. There is uh, a crucifixion. There is a death. And all of it is told with an incredible amount of detail. But we are here today because that is not the end of the story. That the last word is not written by Luke, it's not written by any of us, not by those that would try to inflict that pain on Jesus, but the last word belongs to God, and God always has the last word. And so I want you to hear this story that comes to us from Luke's gospel. A reading from Luke 24, 1 through 11. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not there, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Madeline, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other woman with them who, who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Awesome. I think I'm just going to have her preach. Does that sound good? Will you just, will you just read that? That was... That was great. Thank you so much. So if I were to ask you today, what is your defining story? What would you tell me? We all have a, a defining story. It's that, it's that part of us that sort of shapes our values and our ideals, that sort of gives our lives a sense of meaning and purpose, helps us understand the way that we are to move in this world. We all have one, even if we don't fully know what that defining story is just much. But for some, I acknowledge, for some, that is a story in which they were hurt as a child, right? And that pain was awful, and you carry that with you, and it is always there. And it brings up for you a sense of bitterness and resentment, and sometimes, if we're not careful, that bitterness and that resentment turns into anger. But at some point, right, at some point we have to make the decision whether or not that story is going to impact us the rest of our life. If that's going to be the defining story in our life or not. Several years ago, a guy by the name of Keith Miller wrote a book called The Habitat of Dragons. And in it, he tells a story of when he was in a support group years ago. And in the support group, they were just sort of helping each other sort of live into their best selves. And as a part of that support group, what they did is they would tell their spiritual autobiography, sort of their faith journey story. And one day, Alice shared her story. And Alice began by telling that when she was very young, that she was given up and placed in an orphanage. And more than anything else, she wanted a family. She wanted a home. She wanted to be uh, uh, surrounded by brothers and sisters. She wanted what all of us want. But Alice, as a child, was a little bit awkward. She wasn't all that cute. And as a result of that, she tried to please everybody else. And sometimes, you know, if you try too hard, you end up pushing those people away that you want to br- draw, that you want to draw near. Well, one day, the director of the orphanage came to Alice and said, I have some good news. There is a family that wants to take you home. Now, Alice, I want you to keep in mind, don't get your hopes up too much. This is still a trial, right? She didn't hear any of that. 
All she heard was, there is a family that wants you, and you are going home. And for the next several months, things were going along as best she could tell. They were going great until one day she came home from school, and there in the hallway was her suitcase all packed, and they were taking her back to the orphanage. Now, when Alice was telling this story in the support group, when she got to this point, everybody started to tear up a little bit, and then she sort of took a deep breath, and she cleared her throat, and then she said, almost matter-of-factly, that happened to me seven times by the time I was 13. And as you can imagine, at this point, everybody in the group is just weeping, and somebody gets up and walks across the room in order to give her a hug. But when she got close, she put her arms out, and she goes, no, 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 no. I don't want you to be sad. I don't want you to feel pity for me. I needed that story. I needed that past, because that is what has led me to God. She had this defining story, but yet she didn't allow it to impact her in the way that we may think it might. Now, we are here today to celebrate another defining story. Christians call it the good news of Jesus Christ. And in this story, what we hear is a God that created the cosmos, and the cosmos gave glory to God, the creator. And that cosmos was also created in such a way so that it could sustain human life. And so God created humans in God's very own image and gave them a sense of freedom so that they could choose their own direction. They could choose good or they could choose evil. They were given this path on which they could walk and where they went from there, it was up to us. Well, we sometimes struggled with that and so God sent Moses and prophets in order to sort of help us understand the best way to live. And then a little bit later, Jesus sent Jesus to show us what it means to be human. And he taught us things like that we are to love God with our heart and with our soul and with our mind, and that we should love our neighbors as we love ourselves, that we should even love our enemies. And that when we see somebody that is hurting, when somebody is suffering, that we should show compassion with them. We should help them in any way we can. He taught us that we should forgive. Not just once, that's not nearly enough, but we should forgive over and over and over again. That this is what it means to be human in the fullest sense of the word. But, as we all know, there was a small group of people that were threatened by those teachings, by that challenge, and thought that this Jesus guy must die. And so they colluded with the Romans, and they uh, made sure that he gets uh, arrested and tried for, actually, he wasn't really tried, he just gets arrested for insurrection, and then he was beaten, and he was crucified, and he was killed. And that appeared to be it. Another troublemaker that was silenced. But we're here because that wasn't it. Right? Because on the third day, this group of women showed up at the tomb and they discovered that the tomb had been rolled away and that he was not there. And then, and then he appeared to them. And not just them, but over the next 40 days, he would appear to countless people. For Christians, that is our defining story. We may not always live into it perfectly. We may not always live up to those ideals, but it still presents for us a way that we should live. It's an aspiration that we should be holy, that we should be uh, Jesus-like, that we should be little Christians, that we should always work together to be the very best that we can be. It gives us hope. It gives us a sense, uh, calls us to to be more than we might be on our own. But it's also a reminder that we may want to just ignore our past, just to wipe it all away and pretend it never happened. Whatever pain we've experienced, we need to to remember that it is out of the ashes of our past, though, that God brings this new life. It's what we see over and over again in the scriptures. Frederick Buechner is a Presbyterian minister, and he's written a whole host of books. But he was one of those people that 
had a, a difficult past. He was raised in a dysfunctional home, and his father was an alcoholic, and his father ended up completing suicide when Frederick was in high school. And so when Frederick was uh, a young adult, he was trying really hard to sort of move past that defining story, to not let that be who he is, to define him. And one day he was walking through the streets of New York, and he passed a church, and as the doors opened, he heard the music kind of waft out into the sidewalk. And so he went in. It was the first time in his entire life that he'd ever been to church. And he sat down, and he listened to the music, and he listened to the message, and he was overwhelmed. He was inspired. He was compelled. And over the next three months, he began to listen and to learn more. And three months later, he enrolled in seminary, like you do. <laughs> and so Frederick began to study the scriptures at a graduate level. And what was able to see these stories with fresh eyes, right? Because he was not raised in a family where they told him the story, the stories that we oftentimes tell our children. He never knew any of those. When he was about ready to graduate, somebody said, so Frederick, you've been able to see this story with fresh eyes. How would you define, how would you articulate the arc of the story, and he thought for a moment, and he said, what I see over and over and over again, in the story of the flood, in the story of the exodus, in the story of the exile, in the story of the resurrection, what I see over and over and over again is that the last, the worst thing is never the last thing. The worst thing is never the last thing. It's on every page. That is our defining story. Now, our defining story is either going to make us more human or less human, depending on which story we tell. Our defining story is either going to make us more loving or less loving. Our defining story is either going to make us more concerned for the vulnerable or make us to say, you know what, none of that, I'm looking out for number one. Our defining story is either going to lead us to despair or it's going to fill us with hope. Today, we celebrate and gather around this defining story. I read a survey recently that was just taken in the last month. And one of the things that it said is that 87% of the people in the United States right now have this sense that for the last two years, what we have encountered, what we have experienced is crisis after crisis after crisis after crisis. After crisis after crisis after crisis, right? And even now, as COVID starts to recede a little bit, all of a sudden now there is this war in Ukraine. And we've got inflation to deal with. And it's crisis after crisis after crisis. But Easter... The resurrection, this defining story, it helps us understand how we're going to face those crises, how we're going to face everything that life throws at us. <coughs> Easter allows us to look at our experience, our human experience, what it means to be human in the fullest sense of the word, and to be able to say, you know, that thing that happened to me was awful. And it was painful, and it was unjust. It was hell on earth. It was a nightmare. But it allows us to say, but that wasn't the last of that story. You see, Easter, resurrection, means that we can live in that pain. We can feel that pain. We can even shout at it. Because whatever it is, it doesn't have the last word. That's not the final word that's going to be written. Easter says, the story ain't over just yet. Because the worst thing is never the last thing. Now, maybe you've gone through a divorce. Or your kids are breaking your heart. Or maybe the person that you love is cold. Maybe your business went south because of the pandemic. Maybe life is hellish right now. But Easter, resurrection, it says it's okay to name it. It's okay to feel it, to sit in it for a while. But don't you dare think for one moment that the last word has been written about that situation. Now, I'm not originally from Texas, 
My parents are. Is that close enough? But I've lived in Texas long enough to know that we essentially have three gods, right? The Lord Almighty, George Strait, and football, right? Am I, is that pretty accurate? Is that pretty straight? Now, after the sunrise service, somebody came to me and he said, hey, old head, it's not George Strait, it's Willie Nelson. So I'm going to let you... So I'm going to let you have that debate amongst your family at lunch today, whether it's George Strait. But what we can all agree on is that football in the state of Texas, oh. <laughs> Now, I don't know any stories about George Strait or Willie Nelson, but I do know a great story about football, and I can't wait to tell you, because it took place not too far from here, about a dozen years ago. Just up the road in Grapevine, there was a small Christian high school called Grapevine Faith. And they were getting ready to play one Friday night, the Gainesville State School. Now, it's called the State School, but really it's a high security, maximum security institution. And uh, all of the people that are there are not necessarily students so much as they are inmates, right? As you can imagine, this is not the type of place that you, could never, you would not want to be. Now, Faith had never played Gainesville before, uh, but as the date got clearer, before they even started playing the game, everybody knew the score, right? Because Faith was 7-2. and two. They were vying for a conference championship. Gainesville was 0-8, and, and they had scored two touchdowns the entire season. Not only that, but Faith had 70 kids. They had 11 coaches. They had the most recent, newest equipment. They had a parent base that was supportive and involved. Gainesville had 14 players. They had one coach. They had 11 armed guards. Their equipment was years old. And most of those players had committed felonies, whether it be drugs or assault or battery or robbery. And as a result of that, most of their families had completely written them off. So we knew how that story was going to be, but the, the coach of Grapevine Faith, a guy by the name of Chris Hogan, had this idea. And the idea was, what if for this Friday only, that half of our cheering section went to the other side and rooted for them. That what if they showed them, he sent out an email and he sent it to the entire school and all the parents and he said, here's the message that I want you to send, that you are just as valuable as any other person on the planet. As you can imagine, there were some people that were a little confused by this. The captain of the Grapevine Faith team went in, went in to the coach and said, coach, why are we doing this? I don't get it. And the coach says, I want you to imagine that you don't have a home life. That just about everybody in society has written you off. Now I want you to imagine what it would be like for hundreds of people in one instant to all of a sudden believe in you and cheer you on. What would that be like? So that's what happened. Half of the fans that showed up on that night sat on the other side and they cheered by name for the Gainesville State School Tornadoes. Not only that, but before the game, they, they created one of those long tunnels and a big paper sign for the team to run through. Half of the cheerleaders wore the Gainesville colors and cheered on the other side. Now, the final score was 33 to 14. But I tell you this, that every single one of those players went home a winner that night. The Gainesville team was so excited that they gave their coach a Gatorade bath. He was the first 0-9 coach to ever get a Gatorade bath in the history of football. But later, he would go up to Chris Hogan and grab him by the shoulders, and with tears in his eyes, his voice breaking, said, you will never know what you have done for these kids. You will never know. Now, church, here's what I believe to be true with every ounce of my being, is that those people that have as their defining story the gospel of Jesus Christ are the type of people that would show up and cheer for the other team, that would know to the core of their being that they are loved 
and that they are accepted and that they are valuable and they are going to do everything that they can to make sure that other people feel the same way. The people that have as their defining story, the gospel of Jesus Christ, are those people, are those people that always cheer for the underdog, that will do anything that they can to make sure that those that society has considered to be nobodies know that they are somebody in the eyes of God. On this day, we tell and we celebrate and we gather around this defining story. And we gather around the conviction that, that the world's brokenness is not finally what is most real and true. Today, we gather around the conviction that God is not finished working in this world and that the final word begon, begins, belongs to God, and that word will always be life. Today, we gather around the story and the promise that the worst thing will never be the last thing. You see, that's the defining story of the Christian faith. What's your defining story? Will you pray with me? Eternal loving God, we give thanks for the reminder that we are loved as we are, not for what we do, but simply for who we are, that we are created in your image, that we are loved beyond our wildest imagination, and that you have placed a call upon our life that we should do everything that we can to make sure everybody knows that they are loved too. So God, help us. Help us to be the people that you inspire us to be and to remind us, God, that no matter what life throws at us, that the worst thing is never the last thing and that you will always have the last word. Amen. Y'all, we're going to sing a song we've never sung before, but I think you'll catch on pretty quick. The chorus is really simple. It's just, today is the day, today is the day when love finds a way. Today is the day, today is the day love has the final say. Today is the day love rises. So will y'all sing with me, please? It seems the world's so broken so little to have hope in Sometimes we can't believe The dawn will ever come At times we feel so torn up Our hearts are simply worn out Sometimes we can't believe The dawn will come But then there comes the day and stones are rolled away. Today is the day, today is the day when love finds a way. Today is the day, today is the day love has a final say. Today is the day love rises. Feels like we can't breathe here, and hate is all we see clear. Sometimes we can't believe the dawn will ever come. But then there comes the day, and stones are rolled away. Today is the day, today is the day when love finds a way. Today is the day, today is the day, love has a final say. Oh, today is the day, today is the day, when love finds a way. Today is the day, today is the day, love has a final say. Today is the day, love rises. Love rises. The
women were told that the story they were sharing was an idle tale. You know, we live in a world of just that. We don't know what to believe. We don't know who to trust, who's out to get us, who's trying to make us look like a fool. But we, as people of faith, know that with God, if we remember way back in the first chapter of Luke, when the, Gabriel, when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary to tell her that she would give birth to the Messiah, Gabriel said, with God, nothing is impossible. And so Easter is the day that we claim and proclaim that nothing with God is impossible, that death is not the end, that out of conflict comes resolution, out of darkness comes light, and yes, out of death comes life. And so we gather at this table each week to remember that. We do. And I'd like to invite our communion servers to come forward right now because now is the time that we celebrate as a family of faith and we give thanks and we remember that Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. And after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for all people. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. As we come forward to share in this holy and sacred meal, I invite you to place any gifts that you might have, any prayer concerns you might have in our offering plates here. Our bread is gluten-free, and we also have grape juice that we'll be serving today. And if you'd prefer to have an all-in-one, then you can grab one of those when you come up. Friends, the table has been set, and at Christ's own invitation, all are welcome to share in this meal. Thanks be to God. Let's eat. Friends, we have reached the end of our Easter journey together, and we're going to be singing a song that I'm going to ask you to stand as you're willing and able to sing, because it's definitely one of those kinds of songs. Also, fun fact, I never told you my name. Um, <laughs> my name is Stephanie, but you can call me Steph, and I'm the worship leader here for the 1010 service, as well as for the simple worship service in the chapel over there with Shannon. So, um, it's been a pleasure today, y'all, and I hope you guys will sing this out really loud. The chorus on this one is way easier than even the last one. The chorus is, let the light keep a shining, let it break into the darkness, all the love dares us to see, we'll all be free. There's a world at war, caught in suffering, silent casualties. Oh, God, grant us peace. In these sleepless nights, I can hardly breathe. Despite brutality, I know that we'll be free. I know that we'll be free. And it goes like this. Let the light keep a shining, let it break into the darkness, all the love dares us to see, we'll all be free. It's easy like that. Let's try it one more time. Here we go. Let the light keep a shining, let it break into the darkness, all the love dares us to see, we'll all be free. In these desperate times, love will hold us. Love will join our hands, teach us to have no fear. So we lay our hate 
down to wash their feet when we see each other oh we'll all be free yes we'll all be free let the light keep it shining let it break into the darkness all the love there's is to see we'll all be free let the light keep it shining let it break into the darkness all the love there's is to see we'll all be free then this part is the bridge and it goes over and over and over again it's kind of the promise of the whole thing it goes like this we'll be free free we'll all be free we'll be free free we'll all be free we'll be free Amen. You know, I think I got it that last time through. <laughs> we'll all be free. <laughs> we're so glad that you came today, and uh, we're going to be free. And what else are we going to do? <laughs> what else are we going to do? <laughs> well, starting back up next week, we will have our post-worship conversation where we gather and go a little deeper into the scripture following this service. So that will resume next week along with our youth Sunday school. That will start back up next week as well. No Sunday school this week. And I want to invite you, encourage you to grab one of these ministry stories booklets. Um, they just hot off the press on Friday. Uh, but they're in, on the back table here. And there are some really, really um, inspiring stories about ministry that has happened over the last several months um, that we've been able to share together that has impacted lives. So go ahead and grab one on your way out. So I think we should say it one more time, don't you, Rev Moore? Okay. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. Amen. The people of God, go out into the world to love and to live, proclaiming that Christ is risen. Amen. Go in peace. Go in peace.